You're listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network's exclusive coverage of the Cardinal Health Retail Business Conference 2017, conference and exhibition in San Antonio, Texas. RBC is more than a pharmacy business conference. This interactive gathering of pharmacy owners started in 1990 as a regional show and has since grown into the industry's largest trade show for independent pharmacies. While the conference location changes from year to year, the mission of the RBC remains the same, to help independent pharmacies navigate the ever-changing marketplace by giving them access to the best pharmacy business vendors in the industry. And now, here are your hosts of the Pharmacy Podcast Network, Dr. Aaron Albert and Todd Yuri. Hello and welcome to the Cardinal Health RBC 2017 in San Antonio, Texas. I'm Todd Yuri, the host and founder of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. And today we're going to be talking about Community Pharmacy Enhanced Services Network, the CPESN, I have a special guest today, Mr. Rob Hockman, who's owner of Midtown Pharmacy, First Pharmacy of Martinsville, Medicap Pharmacy, and Edgewood Pharmacy. Welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast in the RBC 2017. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me today. Very good. So this is a dynamic organization, Cardinal Health, as well as the RBC. Before we really get into the CPSN and what that means and what that, that's all about, Tell us, what does, this, what does the RBC mean to you as a pharmacy owner? Why do you invest the time and money to come to this conference? No, I think, you know, getting together with pharmacists from all over the place, it, it gives you a chance to kind of talk to them, to see what they're doing in and above, you know, normal pharmacy, to get ideas for pharmacy practice. You know, I walk away from RBC every single year with an idea of something that, hey, I'd like to try and do that this year, whether it's been DSMT in the past, um, diabetes self-management training, or immunizations, travel vaccines. There's always something that I bring back to one of our stores from RBC, from just sitting down and talking with all of the pharmacists that come here that, that are doing something unique. Tell us about your pharmacies. You have four pharmacies. Yes. Uh, tell us about each of them. Um, tell us how you got into pharmacy, a little bit about your background. Gotcha, okay. I graduated from pharmacy school in, at Chapel Hill in North Carolina in 2002. What I found out when I was at pharmacy school that I was really not good at taking directions from other people. <laughs> uh, and so I, I figured it, you know, the only way I could be my own boss was to start my own pharmacy. At least that's the story I say. Um, I grew up, I grew up in small towns in North Carolina. We always had independent pharmacies. Uh, that's all I knew growing up, and I wanted to continue that after I got out of pharmacy school. So I worked for a year, saved everything I made, and opened up Midtown Pharmacy in 2003. And for the next, you know, seven eight years, we grew Midtown Pharmacy from scratch. Um, in that course of time, my wife and I had four children. And so I have, I have two boys, two girls, they're 12, 10, eight, and six. And so I had a decision to make is, okay, do I have just one pharmacy and continue to work, you know, as many hours as we work at the pharmacy to support that one pharmacy? Or is there a way that I can free up some of my time? And so I thought, hey, well, you know, instead of having one, why can't I not have, you know, a few pharmacies, take a little bit from each pharmacy, maybe have a little bit more flexibility and time to be able to spend with family and then also work on growing all these things, these ideas that you know, we had you know, to, to make these pharmacies better. So in 2009, we started looking at other pharmacies to buy. Um, and so we've just, you know, over the year after year, acquired a pharmacy here, a pharmacy there, all, all within an hour of each other to have them close. Uh, each pharmacy is kind of, it, it's interesting, every pharmacy is a little bit different. Um, they serve different populations, they have, have different needs. Um, one of our pharmacies, Midtown Pharmacy, uh, does a lot more with children's things and, and, and is more focused on women's health issues from providing breast pumps to, um, you know, children's boutique things, um, special stuff for, for children that need medications. Uh, Medicap Pharmacy is our, you know, was was the one that basically we do most of our compounding and DME out of. Edgewood Pharmacy is our most recent purchase, and, and that one is actually next to a university, uh, oh, Elon great. University. And so we've worked partnering with the university and providing flu shot clinics for the university throughout the year, travel vaccinations, because the students have a middle semester that they all do travel. Excellent. And so, you know, we've just kind of done that. Martinsville was uh, a pharmacy that had shut down and that we had opened back up. And, you know, that has a lot of issues with opioid abuse, controlled substance. So that, that's kind of been the, the focus there. 
So everyone's a little bit different. So you mentioned, Rob, about coming together and the reason that you come to RBC, part of that is really networking with other yes. pharmacy owners. That's really the meaning and purpose behind the CPESN is that strength of that network, strength yes. in numbers. So just give our listeners, give our audience an overview. What is the CPESN? And really, how did it come from North Carolina in partnership with the NCPA? Okay, so, so about three years ago, uh, there was a group in North Carolina called Community Care of North Carolina, which is kind of an arm of North Carolina Medicaid. North Carolina Medicaid gave them, I will say, direction to say, hey, how can we bring the total cost of health care down to our Medicaid patients, our really sick patients? And CCNC said, we would like to try a collaborative practice model. You know, we'd like to include hospitals, physicians, nurses, and pharmacies. And so at the time, one of the pharmacists in Charlotte, North Carolina, his name's Joe Moose, if you've heard of him. Joe Moose, um, I know very yes, well. Yes, Joe He's Moose. He's been on our show. Exactly. <laughs> and so he had the connections at Community Care in North Carolina and said, you know what, we can do this as pharmacies. You know, I'll help start working on building a network of pharmacies across the state of North Carolina that can provide what are called enhanced services. So CPESN, or I'll just call it CPSN because it's just a lot to say CPESN, is Community <laughs> Pharmacy Enhanced Services Network. And what that basically means is that we do more than just putting pills in a bottle, which is what every single one of you guys do. You do more than that. You know, we're talking about, you know, delivery. We offer free delivery. Uh, we have patients that can't get out of their house. They don't have family members. They don't have access to public transportation. Um, th those are the kind of barriers they face, or they, they have language barriers so that they don't understand how to take their medication, so their adherence issues. Uh, they were looking, Joe was looking, and CCNC, they were looking for pharmacies that could bridge those gaps to, to find out why these patients' health care costs were continually going up, and is there anything that we can do as a collaborative team to bring those down? And our pharmacies, part of it, was to basically, since we see a patient on average 35 times a year, was to be able to influence our patient's outcomes and their health and their happiness by all the number of times that we interact with them by providing them these extra services that we already all do. And then ultimately, and in, in my mind, the most important thing right now, um, as far as the future of this, is to show that, hey, what we do makes a difference and we decrease the amount of total healthcare spend an insurance plan has to spend on those sick patients because of the amount of care that they receive, especially from the pharmacy. So the initiative started in the state of North Carolina, but it's expanding. Can you share with our listeners and the audience, how many states are you into and are there chapters that we can actually, from a grassroots perspective, grow the network? Yes, absolutely. So right now, I, I want to say that Doug Hoy of NCPA said there are about nine states that are already going live right. with CPSN. There are multiple, I think six more, six to 12 more states that are in the process of doing it. Uh, most states have what's called a luminary, which is a person that is spearheading uh, the quote unquote CPSN network in their state. So what I would suggest is if people are interested in CPSN in their specific state, they go to the website, which is www.cpesn.com, and, and go there and see for your state if there's a luminary. If so, contact that luminary. If not, then contact NCPA to come find out how you can be the luminary for that state. Very good. So as a pharmacy owner, I'm listening to the show, I'm in the audience. What is this really going to do for independent community pharmacy? And I know that sounds like a simplistic question, but one of, in our previous session, when we were interviewing uh, Deanne Mullins and Doug Hoy about uh, CPESN, they prefaced a lot of this. And a question from the audience, and I'm sure in the minds of, um, of pharmacy owners is, hey, sometimes I can't even play. Sometimes the uh, patients are being taken away from me based on a PBM contract, based on being forced to go to mail order. So tell us facets of the benefit of this network. One of those facets being changing the payment model, but also the protection of our patients that want to stay with us, the independent pharmacy owner. Can you kind of elaborate on that part of it? Absolutely. Uh, you know, this, this is the part where we can say, you know, 
this isn't going to work or we've already been down that road before, we've done stuff before. In North Carolina specifically, we had a project called the Asheville Project, which was if you've ever, you know, talked about, you know, pharmacists first providing clinical services, you know, we, we demonstrated that in Asheville with asthmatics that we could, you know, decrease their cost of care. We just never did anything with it. And, and we relied on just maintaining that, that PBM-centric model of how we get paid. And if you looked at the slideshow that Deanne talked about today, I mean, 10% of total healthcare costs is only is PBM. That's it, just 10%. And that's what we're stuck in. We can't get out of that. And, and like I said earlier, there is no way that I will ever see a PBM say, you know what, we want to pay you more as a PBM. That's not what PBM's jobs are, are for. Their job is to decrease the cost for the health plan. I mean, honestly, that's what they're supposed to do. So our thought is, and my hope with CPSN, is that we get out of that PBM-centric mindset and say, okay, there's a whole 90% of the healthcare spend that we can have a part in because of what we do. We don't just put pills in a bottle, but maybe we, if we can show, and in North Carolina, we, we're collecting the data and we have the data to prove that we can decrease the total healthcare spend as part of a team that we can go to other private payers, self-employers, um, people that self-insure themselves, and, and say, listen, here we've already shown that we can save money here. Let us do that for you. And I think that's, you know, that's the beauty of it is that you know, we'll broadly have this whole national network of pharmacies that can do that and that we have something to work with instead of being fragmented. So let's talk about the facets of pharmacy. In growing our business as independent pharmacy owners, we have to continue to offer different services to the demographic within our community that's asking for those services. Senior care pharmacy, specialty pharmacy, compounding. Is this all under the umbrella of CPESN? I think it can be. Those are services that we do offer. Some, some places we can't do specialty where we are because just contractually we are not allowed to do that, but we do compounding. So that's one of the ones we offer. However, my, my hope is, is that as we show that we're able to decrease cost to a payer, that then those avenues also begin to open up. And they say, well, listen, if you, if you did this just with diabetics, you know, what if I gave you my transplant patients? You know, I wonder what you could right. do with them. And then all of a sudden it's, it's opened up specialty because, I mean, right now the PBM says, hey, we can handle that and we can decrease your cost. But if we can show that we can do it a different way and be successful at it, then, you know, instead of dealing with the PBM, we move around the PBM. And that collaboration is pretty important because if you can yes. find a privately owned specialty pharmacy possibly in your area to partner with, you can insulate yourself from another PBM that offers a, a retail exactly. pharmacy set and a specialty pharmacy set from taking that business away from you because you already have the service for your customer exactly. for an HIV patient or for a hep C patient or for a, some specialty med that yes. needs to be monitored and managed. Exactly. So is that part of the network too, is really reaching out eventually to other facets of pharmacy? I think so. I think, I think that's the hope is that we kind of take back what we do as a pharmacy and including all parts of pharmacy, including specialty, compound, the things that the PBMs have tried to carve us out of in the past you know, five to 10 years. So the data is pretty important. Talk to us about how much data do we have to share with other providers, other luminaries per se, that can go to politicians, that can go to uh, lawmakers and say, look at this data, look what the CPESN network is doing to the cost of care. So share, us, share with us a little bit about that too. Okay, so in North Carolina, that's been the biggest thing. And so when we provide this care, we have to basically log into a care platform and log what we do. And each patient is, is assessed a risk score based on how complex their, their conditions are, their therapy is, et cetera. And we basically, you know, look at a multitude of different factors, number of doctor visits they make, how many hospital admissions they've had, um, what their compliance percentage is, have they been to a pharmacy, how often they're going to a pharmacy, uh, have they had a CMR, you know, all of those things. And so we look at it and say, okay, for these highest risk patients, you know, here's what we've done, here are the steps that we've taken, here's ultimately year one, year two, year three, and now going into year four, here's what we've done with those high-risk patients. And, and I don't know the specific numbers for North Carolina. I know that we have saved, you know, 
a lot of money for those high-risk patients in the state of North Carolina. And our hope is at the end of year four of the grant that we do have with North Carolina Medicaid, that we go to other private payers and say, you know, here's our data. Because that's always been the thing is you can go to a payer and say, you know what, I I can save you money. And they go, show me how. They don't want to be the guinea pig. You know, they don't. And they don't want to pay for something that's a maybe. So now we have something that is definite and we have numbers that we can show them. So at the end of year four, they'll compile all this, all these numbers. And for other states right now, they can look at the preliminary numbers. All they have to do is either go to NCPA or CPSN and say, hey, you know, can you show me what data for North Carolina there is right now? Because we've had three years worth of it so far. So this sounds aggressive. It's exciting. And I think we have to take it in steps. One of the things that I'm looking at from the perspective of the value of independent pharmacy in comparison to other means of pharmacy services is, how does this change or improve for a plan the star ratings? And how does that roll up? How does that data roll up? How does CPESN make independent pharmacy shine as this, uh, as this network of pharmacies doing best things, best practices, best value, rather than just to pay for, you know, pay for the service, it's actually a value-based payment model. Agreed. I think you have to look at it from a completely different way. I mean, if you look at kind of MTM and star ratings right now, I mean, I feel like they're, you know, they're, they're cost-saving tactics, you know. Originally it was, okay, I want you to switch this patient from brand X to generic Y. And now there's a big right. push for, you know, this patient should be on 30-day to improve your inherent scores, you push them to a 90-day. And that's all the PBM cares about. But I think what we look at is as we take care of that patient and, and you take care of that patient, that it doesn't matter whether they're on a 30, 60, 90, whatever whatever day supply, you're taking care of them, you're helping them take ownership over their own health. And so you will see all this, and that's what we've seen is all these adherence measures, those things that are measured for star ratings, you know, have all fallen in line. I mean, we're, we're a five-star pharmacy and we don't do anything different than what we've, you know, always done. We just take care of the patient. And it's consistency, I, isn't it? Yeah, it is. We do, you know, we do the same. We treat every single patient the same, whether they're the, you know, in the sickest, you know, percentile for CCNC or they're in the healthiest. We're treating them all the same way. But it's kind of funny how you, once you start treating them and, and all those numbers that are MTM, star rating type numbers tend to fall in place. So if you have a diabetic patient that also is suffering with another disease state per se, how is the best practices under the umbrella of the CPSN helping a pharmacy owner to supplement other things happening to that patient to help them be healthier? Well, I think they leave that, it's, and that's one of the great things, is they leave it up to the pharmacy to do what they do best. Okay. So for us, we have, you know, let's say we have DSMT, which we, we do. So we do diabetes self-management training for our diabetics, but we also, we don't just go DSMT if they have comorbidities, if they have, you know, renal function issues, if they have high blood pressure issues, exactly. they have heart failure issues, we, we address those too. So it's not like we're just treating one disease state, we're treating the whole patient. We're looking at them and making recommendations as to, okay, well they were put on this for this, but then they got this added for the side effect of this, and when they got it, this added, and, and it, it's amazing how much duplication in therapy, and I, it, it just is amazing that all the, the stuff that you can, once you sit down with the patient, can find out. But it's, I think it goes back to not treating just one thing, it's treating the overall you know, patient just in everything that they do. And, and we don't look at, even though we may get sent somebody for diabetes and they do have high blood pressure, you know, we're not looking at just their diabetes. We're looking at everything, you know, because our goal for our patients is to basically make them healthier, make them happier, and give them a better quality of life. So to me, if I look at a pharmacy, 300, 400 prescriptions a day, moving along, pretty, pretty busy, yes. lots of techs, three or four pharmacists, To implement some new program, it feels daunting to me. It it makes me like, oh goodness, now I have to do something else. So what is CPSN doing for the uh, pharmacy owner to to take this in stages, to take this in little bites so that we can actually become part of the network and offering these other services and then having the data to eventually pass back to the entire organization to really strengthen independent pharmacy? I think that's kind of a twofold answer. The first is CPSN, when you, when you sign up in North Carolina, you have a checklist of all these services that you can provide. 
So if you can't provide a service, then you don't check it off. If you don't have anybody that can do DSMT, you're not, you're not gonna check DSMT. Um, now, does that mean you'll get DSMT patients? No, you probably wouldn't. But it, it at least gives you whatever your expertise is, something that you're already doing, you will get you, those patients that fit that and are in your area. Um, so it, it helps so that you're not having to just jump right in and be an expert at everything. But on the other hand, you know, I would say personally, how can we not afford to do this? I know a lot of pharmacists that I talk to say, you know what, all I've got time to do is just sit on the counter, fill the prescriptions and get them out to the patient, right. which I understand. Trust me, the pressure's there, but we're gonna have margin pressures that, that shrink every single year. You know, we're not gonna make the same this year, we're not gonna make the same next year, the year after that we're not gonna make the same. And so we truly can't afford to just sit there and do nothing and just continue to fill scripts. At some point you have to say, okay, I've got to bite the bullet and, and try and do some of this because otherwise the PBM model is just not sustainable for independent pharmacy unless, unless you're filling thousands of scripts a day. I mean, that's the honest truth. Right. So in, in closing, what is your advice for a pharmacy owner listening to this podcast or in the audience right now as next steps in order to get involved and once again, not to feel overwhelmed? Gotcha. I say, you know, first steps is if this is something you're interested in, and I hope it is, hope that you are interested in that, you know, go to the CESPN or CPESN website, um, go to NCPA, find out how you can get involved, however that may be. And in your state, it may be different than in North Carolina, what they're doing, but, you know, try and find a way to get involved. Even if it's you can't provide it, maybe you can help find other pharmacists and other pharmacies that can help provide that and build that network so that it's a national network instead of a statewide network. But also, you know, think about the future of what, where you think pharmacy should be in the next five years, in the next 10 years, and, and what, you know, you're doing. I think all of us will say that we do more than just fill prescriptions. We all take care of our patients. We all, you know, say we do a lot more than that. We provide a lot more value to our patients than just putting pills in a bottle. Because heck, if all we did was put pills in a bottle, we'd go work for a chain. Uh, right. You know, so I, I, you know, implore all of you guys to try and, you know, even if you can't do much, do a, do a little bit, you know, you know, take that risk. You know, we all we started our own pharmacies, bought into pharmacies. We took that risk knowing, you know, that it may not pan out, but we're going to take that risk. This is the same thing. You know, we don't move forward unless somebody takes a risk and tries to move us forward. And that's honestly, you know, what, what Joe's vision was for pharmacy. It's the vision that a lot of us pharmacists in that network have is this is where we see pharmacy going in five to 10 years. And we want to be on the ground floor of that instead of playing catch up. I'd like to thank Cardinal Health for giving us a platform to talk about the uh, CPESN. Um, and on behalf of the conference, the RBC, um, Mr. Uh, Rob Cockman, thank you so much. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate Cardinal it. Cardinal Health, helping independent pharmacies successfully grow their pharmacy businesses for over 45 years while advocating stronger relationships with patients for healthier communities throughout the country. We thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Podcast live coverage of the Cardinal Health RBC 2017. Be sure to join us next year for the RBC 2018 in downtown beautiful San Diego, California, June 27th through June 30th.